Recording started. Sergeant Polite, you may begin your opening statement. Good morning and welcome to the remote hearing on the Committee of Fire and Emergency Management. At this time, will all panelists please turn on their videos? Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit a testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation and we, will, we, we are ready to begin shortly. Chair, we are ready to begin. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing uh, today on the city's emergency management plan for a potential second wave of COVID-19 infections. Uh, I'd like to point out that we've been joined by my colleagues so far. I see Council Member Cabrera and council member Deutsch. I'd like to begin by reading an opening statement. By the way, please forgive me, I was in my basement, but I had to come outside because of screaming, screaming loud children. Uh, good morning. I am councilman Jober. I have to gavel in, right? Yep. That officially starts the meeting. Uh, good morning. I am council member Joseph Borelli. I'm chair of the committee on fire and emergency management. Uh, I'm joined by, as I mentioned, Council Member uh, Deutsch and Cabrera at this moment. Uh, I'd like to begin by having a moment. Uh, thank you. So today we're here to discuss the important and chilling topic of the city's preparedness for a second wave of COVID-19 impacting our population. As we know, we're already seeing uh, news stories emerge about this wave hitting uh, and spiking in other parts of the country. Although the COVID-19 outbreak in New York City has slowed uh, and we should be thankful and business reopening has begun, experts have warned a second wave of COVID infections is likely to occur during the fall and winter months. To be better prepared for the next disease outbreak, whenever it may come, the committee plans to review and assess the city's emergency management response to COVID-19 in hopes of learning what measures can be taken to protect our first responders and ensure the highest quality emergency medical services for all New Yorkers. During the early stages of the outbreak, the city uh, experienced massive increase in emergency and medical calls and EMS workers valiantly worked to meet uh, an ever increasing demand for care. At the time, there were widespread shortages of essential medical equipment, forcing healthcare workers and first responders to ration vital N95 masks and other personal protective equipment, and hospitals to scramble to secure medical equipment to combat the disease, such as ventilators. The committee would like to hear from the administration and New York City Emergency Management on how the city will be better prepared to move forward. Additionally, the committee will also hear two pieces of legislation, both of which I have introduced. First, intro number 824, which would require the fire department to implement a comprehensive plan for increasing the recruitment and hiring of individuals with prior military service. Additionally, the department would be required to report on relevant recruitment efforts and the rates of hiring of individuals with prior military experience. Second, the introduction, uh, second introduction would require the fire department to issue reports on the department's fire alarm inspection unit. The bill specifically requires two years of reporting on the staffing uh, of the inspection unit, the number of inspections occurring during that prior physical year, 
and the time elapsed for the processing and conduction of fire alarm inspections. The committee looks forward to hearing from both of the, the administration and the public on this important oversight. I have to introduce you in case you're listening to my child scream. This is my son. He's in the window screaming really loud if you hear him. So I apologize for that. And that's why I am outside uh, and a bit, a bit a little less formal than uh, I would otherwise be. So I'll now turn it over to the moderator, uh, committee counsel, Josh Kingsley, to go over some procedural items. Uh, thank you, Chair Borelli. Um, I am Josh Kingsley, counsel to the Fire and Emergency Management Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, after which you will be unmuted by a host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelists to give testimony will be representatives from the New York City Fire Department and New York City Emergency Management. For FDNY, testimony will be provided by First Deputy Commissioner Laura Cavanaugh, Chief of Department John Sudnick, and Chief of EMS Lillian Bonsignore. And for NISAM, testimony will be provided by First Deputy Commissioner Andy De Amora. Additionally, the following representatives will be available for answering questions from the Fire Department Chief Joseph Jardin and Deputy Director Defisa Noonan, and from NISAM, Ben Krakauer, Executive Advisor to the Commissioner. I will call on you to speak when it is your turn. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh, Chief Sudnick, Chief Bonsignore, Chief Jardin, First Deputy Commissioner Detmora, Deputy Director Noonan, and Mr. Krakauer. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to answer honestly to council member questions? First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh? Yes, I do. Chief Sudnick? I do. Chief Bonsignore? I do. Chief Jardin? I do. Deputy Director Noonan? Deputy Director Noonan, do we hear you or? Can you hear me now? We can, thank you. I do. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and finally, Mr. Krakow. Mr. Krakow, are you unmuted now? I do. Thank you I so do. much, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, folks, you could uh, proceed as, as uh, I believe the fire department's gonna go first, so go ahead. Can you guys hear me, Josh? Yeah, good, all right. Good morning, Chair Borelli and all of the council members present. My name is Laura Cavanaugh and the first deputy commissioner of the New York City Fire Department. In addition to our colleagues from New York City Emergency Management, I'm joined today by Chief of Department, John Sudnick, Chief of Emergency Medical Services, Lillian Bonsignor, Chief Joseph Jordan, the Chief of Fire Prevention, and Nafisa Noonan, the Assistant Commissioner of Recruitment and Retention. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the fire department's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and our agency's preparedness for a potential second wave of the virus. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the extraordinary time we are in as a city and as a department. We are in the midst of a global pandemic in which our members responded to historic numbers of calls under unprecedented and unknown circumstances. We are in the third week of demonstrations against racial, racial injustice sparked by the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmed Aubrey. As they respond to COVID-19 at work, our members are also grappling with COVID-19 at home as they experience sickness and loss in friends, family, coworkers, and even themselves. As they respond to the demonstrations, they are also confronting issues of racial injustice themselves. As always, our members have risen to the occasion responding to both of these once in a generation events, ensuring fire and medical calls are answered and the public was cared for no matter the circumstances. 
The COVID-19 pandemic presented a massive challenge for emergency medical services across the country and the world. At FDNY, this meant rising to meet a rapidly expanding workload to reach record heights of 6,500 medical emergencies a day, cardiac arrest calls and death tolls that have never been higher, and confronting a virus that even as we were providing medical care to patients was taking a toll on our members. We were able to succeed under these difficult circumstances because we took early action to shore up our resources and make preparations before the virus hit. We remained flexible and adapted to an operational environment that shifted daily and sometimes hourly, and most importantly, because we were able to draw upon the strength and professionalism of our members. We were also aided by courageous partners from New York and across the country. Through the extraordinary efforts of our EMTs, paramedics, firefighters, officers, and civilian support staff, the department was able to thrive, giving the city our best when it needed us most. COVID-19 has taken lives across the world, and at the fire department, we felt pain among our own family. We mourn the loss of 11 members of the department, auto mechanic James Villeco, Deputy Chief Inspector Syed Rahman, Fiscal Services Supervisor Kelly Childs, Supervising Fire Protection Inspector Edward Mungin, EMT Gregory Hodge, EMT John Red, EMT Idris Bay, Supervisor of Mechanics Thomas Ward, EMT Richard Seabury, Supervising Fire Inspector Mark Remolino, and other members, another member of the Bureau of Fire Prevention whose family asked for anonymity. anonymity. We also wish to recognize the of paramedic Paul Carey of Denver, Colorado, who traveled to New York as part of the Federal Emergency Management Agency's National Ambulance Contract. One of the reasons that the fire department has been successful in combating the COVID-19 pandemic up to this point is that we took early and decisive action to prepare for COVID-related cases. In January, the Office of Medical Affairs researched the virus and drew upon the department's experience responding to the Ebola and H1N1 outbreaks to help streamline necessary adjustments. We consulted with the Centers for Disease Control and the New York City Department of Health and the State Department of Health. And we took steps to ensure that our equipment was appropriate to meet requirements of a COVID outbreak. For example, we confirmed that the rate of air exchange in our ambulances met CDC standards and was sufficiently safe for our members and patients during and after a potential COVID patient was present in the vehicle. We revised decontamination protocols and increased the rate of cleaning and disinfecting at EMS and fire facilities. The department also made changes to the way that we dispatch medical calls, implementing a fever cough call type with 911 dispatchers asking callers questions about symptoms and at that point about recent travel. This change, which we made on January 30th, enabled the department to analyze data about the virus as it began impacting New York, helping us to track the scope of the spread and better inform our partners in city government. It also helped us to advise our members during each response so that they would know when to don appropriate personal protective equipment before arriving at each patient. One of the key areas of focus as we prepared for COVID-19 to reach New York was securing enough PPE to enable our members to do their jobs safely. This involved reviewing our available stockpiles and developing new sources to drastically increase our inventory. The Office of Medical Affairs closely tracked CDC and DOHH and New York State DOH guidance on PPE PPE usage and created training and instruction for members. On March 4th, we activated two incident management teams. One was detailed to emergency management and the other was assigned to help manage the FDNY's COVID response, including our PPE inventory. The IMT was very successful at securing supplies of N95 masks, eye protection, gowns, and gloves, even as agencies across the world vied for the same materials. We developed and began distributing a daily internal update regarding COVID data, changes in protocols, and precise tracking of PPP inventory and usage. During this time, we executed several moves to increase the number of resources available to respond to the outbreak. Working with our partners at Emergency Management and FEMA, we requested and received approval to use hundreds of ambulances staffed by EMTs and paramedics from around the country under the National Ambulance Contract. Through our agreements with private hospitals who participate in the 911 system, we requested that they increase their share of ambulance tours, and we brought in volunteer ambulances from across the city to respond to 911 calls as well. By expediting training at our EMS and fire academies, we increased our available fire and medical personnel as well, graduating hundreds of probationary EMTs, paramedics, and firefighters during the worst of the pandemic. And we accelerated training courses to get other members and instructors back into the field. 
By adding so many resources into the 911 system, we were able to continue effectively covering medical calls even as they soared to record-breaking levels. Early on in the COVID outbreak, we made changes to the way our members staff their shifts to reduce exposure and mitigate the spread of the virus within our own ranks by decreasing the number of partners that an EMT or paramedic work with each week and limiting the pool from which a firehouse could draw on for overtime. We closely monitored the growing medical leave rate and worked 24 seven to make operational changes needed to continue our response. Each change we made required coordination between EMS and fire operations, our medical staff, and each administrative bureau. Examples of this include instituting a mobile computer-aided dispatching system, which allowed us to include the NAC units from across the country and the New York City 911 dispatching matrix. We also instituted a telemedicine program as part of the 911 system, which put callers reporting lower acuity medical issues in touch with a medical professional by phone in order to reduce the number of ambulance responses and transports. This benefited our members, the patients we serve, and the hospitals that were overwhelmed at the time. Each change was a significant undertaking, and those efforts, while lengthy, have given us a blueprint for which to make immediate changes if a second COVID wave were to occur. The department's IMT continued handling PPE sourcing and distribution throughout the surge. We worked with a wide variety of sources, including emergency management, DOHMH, DCAS, and the mayor's office, and we developed a large number of our own sources throughout the world. As we all learned, tragically, many healthcare organizations around the world struggled to obtain appropriate levels of PPE. Thanks to the tenacious efforts of the members tasked to obtain supplies, the fire department has always been able to maintain enough PPE to meet or exceed CDC guidelines for all operations. As the pandemic unfolded, we also worked to support our members when they were off duty. We coordinated with the Department of Education to help our members to enroll their children in the regional enrichment centers across the city, provided meals and a safe place for children to learn while their parents were busy serving the community. We partnered with Lyft and City Bike to provide alternative forms of transportation for members to commute. We launched a program with the FDNY Foundation to provide free lodging for members who wish to forgo home, being home to avoid potential exposure of family members. As of last week, nearly 600 members have made use of it and others have enrolled in similar lodging programs run by the administration. We worked with Health and Hospitals Corporation to provide free COVID testing for all of our members. And most recently, we worked with the CDC and Quest Diagnostics to make free COVID antibody testing available to all FDNY employees. It has now been more than a month since the peak of our call volume. However, it is worth cautioning New Yorkers today and periodically as we move forward that New York City is still in the midst of this pandemic. I'm happy to report that our medical call volume has reduced from historic highs. The last of the National Ambulance Contract units departed at the end of May. We have reduced the surge tours that we are requesting from our private hospital partners. And we no longer have a need to include the Volunteer Ambulance Corp in the, new, in the 911 system. We continue building and refining our telemedicine system, which served a crucial function over the last few months. We continue to track data in real time, and we are prepared to immediately shift resources again if the virus experiences a second wave in New York City. As businesses and community activities began to reopen, we will remain vigilant and take swift action to meet any increased demand for emergency medical services. We remain in close contact with our partners at emergency management, DOHMH, the mayor's office, and the CDC, and our doctors continue to monitor developments with the virus around the world. We are also building a stockpile of PPE so that if a second COVID wave does occur, we have an ample supply of equipment ready to use. We all saw firsthand the disorganized distribution of PPE at the federal level. We will continue to ensure that FDNY operations are not impacted by that dysfunction by building our own supply of PPE, which will afford us the flexibility and independence that comes with not having to scramble and compete against other agencies. We also continue to support our members in every way possible. We have advocated for line of duty benefits for our members who lost their lives to COVID-19, and we know that the risk of losing members in the future is very real. All of our frontline members have been through an extremely difficult stretch, and that's why our Counseling Services Unit has rolled out expanded counseling resources, sending peer counselors to visit every firehouse and EMS station, and communicating with members via a wide variety of media, media including department orders, digital resources, dispatch messaging, and in-person encounters. 
CSU is currently in the process of reaching out to every probationary firefighter and EMT who graduated during the pandemic, knowing that for those members, the first experiences of their career took place in some of the most harrowing environments possible. Over the next several weeks, we'll be conducting an external after action review of the department's performance at the height of the pandemic. Senior leadership will be evaluating the way that each unit function, paying particular attention to areas of achievement that lagged and making necessary improvements. These are challenging times for the FDNY and the communities we serve. However, in the 155 year history of the department, we have faced down countless obstacles and triumphed in the most difficult of environments. I am proud of the courage and perseverance that our members have shown through the COVID crisis. And as a department, we will continue striving to provide the best possible service to the people of New York City. I'll defer now to my colleagues at New York City Emergency Management. Thank you. Okay, now I think you can hear us, right? Um, thank you, First Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh. Good morning, Chairperson Borelli and members of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. I'm First Deputy Commissioner Andrew Diamora, and I'm happy to be here today on behalf of New York City Emergency Management to discuss the role that emergency management played and continues to play in the COVID-19 response. I am joined by my colleague, Ben Krakauer, Executive Advisor to Commissioner Emergency Management. Before I get into our response to COVID-19, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge how challenging the past few months have been for everyone in New York City. We are all experiencing current events through our own lens, but public service in the city is built on the strength of our diversity, our respect for one another, and our ability to listen and learn from each other. It's hard to express how dedicated the emergency managers of the city are, but please believe me, our team will stay the course no matter the weather. Let me shift now to discuss the last few months at our agency. In December 2019, cases of novel coronavirus were confirmed in Wuhan, China. Cases quickly spread across the globe. New York City began to prepare for what would become a global health crisis. Emergency management started to prepare for this inevitable COVID-19 in New York City in January. We held our first interagency coordination call, followed by a series of tabletop exercises designed to review and discuss the citywide response to this developing pandemic. We held the first mayoral exercise on January 24th and the second on March 2nd. Both exercises focused on the situational COVID-19 update by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. And agencies shared their preparedness for COVID-19 and detailed their response plans and protocols. Between the two exercises, we continued to convene interagency conference calls, meetings, and workshop with city agencies and our federal partners. Emergency management discussed the medical supply chain with the New York State Department of Health and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Agency leadership reviewed guidelines and recommendations for social distancing, frontline worker protection, the distribution and need for personal protective equipment, and public messaging. We continue to develop scenarios to de uh, prepare for the cascading impacts of healthcare surge, fatality management, major event cancellations, decreased citywide workforce, food and supply shortage, and potential virus mutations. Although the first case of COVID-19 in New York City was not confirmed until March, Emergency Management activated the Emergency Operations Center on February 1st to implement the federal quarantine directives and build a structure of interagency crisis action planning task forces to rapidly develop policies, procedures, and recommendations to implement as the situation worsened. Tasks and responsibilities of HC staff evolved to meet the needs of the emergency. For example, the operations division expanded its daily roles by staffing the COVID-19 information desk and deploying citywide incident coordinators to conduct daily visits to main food distribution centers to confirm normal operations and to evaluate hospital surge sites. Senior agency leaders were charged with implementing and managing massive operations, including food distribution, 
healthcare surge management, isolation hoteling, continuity of operations, and fatality management. Many of these operations continue to serve New Yorkers today. One of the first priorities was to operationalize and expand the city's capability to treat and rapidly expanding number of patients. This included operations to coordinate medical search staffing, medical search space, and a procurement of critical medical supplies. Emergency management and other city agencies coordinated to open large alternate care sites in non-traditional settings. This included the Jacob Javits Center in Manhattan, Billie Jean King Tennis Facility in Queens, and the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal. For COVID-19, a logistician supported a range of operations, including hospital surge, fatality management, donations, food distribution, and field testing sites. To date, the Logistics Center has handled more than 2,000 requests, which comprise more than 7,000 assets, such as generators, tents, and specialized personnel. A significant portion of the emergency management stockpile generally used during coastal storms, and including special medical needs cots, emergency food, and medical supplies were deployed. Items not contained in our stockpile were procured from the state and federal governments, as well as the private sector. We assisted in distributing PPE for hospitals and nursing homes received through the Department of Health's warehouse. Additionally, we hosted a weekly citywide donations management call to inform city agencies and nonprofit organizations on COVID-19 donation processes and issues. Emergency management quickly sourced and entered into emergency contracts with healthcare staffing firms that have brought thousands of doctors, nurses, and other medical professionals to the bedsides of New Yorkers when they needed it most. We set up a staffing cell that rapidly placed volunteers into hospitals and worked with airline partners to fly them in. More than 2,500 staff have been referred to 128 healthcare facilities to address COVID-19 needs. Further, emergency management coordinated the request and placement of medical providers from the United States Armed Forces who provided care in all of our public hospitals. Mass care operations during COVID-19 response have not been limited to hospital sites. Our agency continues to coordinate a hotel program to provide rooms for New Yorkers from congregate settings for healthcare workers. The hotel program also supported the relocation of vulnerable individuals from congregate settings like supportive housing programs. The city set up several emergency food programs, including Department of Education grab and go meals at over 400 citywide sites, senior meal deliveries, and deliveries to vulnerable populations. Emergency management has assisted in logistical operations for this, such as determining location sites across the five boroughs and working with the Get Food staff, TLC, National Guard on logistical setup. More than 28 million meals have been served in an effort to ensure no New Yorker goes hungry. In most disasters, human service operations like service centers allow individuals to access critical services in person. Due to the nature of COVID-19, however, our service center partners decided a virtual service center would be the safest option. The virtual service center became the Help Now website, a one-step shop for uh, information on how New Yorkers can give assistance and receive help during this time. The HC also rolled out the COVID-19 pet hotline, a resource for pet owners who need assistance if they've uh, been affected by the virus. Public messaging to New Yorkers expand, expanded beyond social media and websites during this emergency. The Notify NYC team launched a short code messaging program to ensure New Yorkers receive critical updates about COVID-19. More than 840,000 individuals have subscribed to these messages in English and more than 31,000 for Spanish. As of today, 177 English and 174 Spanish messages have been sent to subscribers. Notify NYC subscribers can receive COVID-19 messages in traditional Chinese or simplified Chinese as well. In addition, we sent two wireless emergency alerts to all New York City cell phones in English and Spanish. With a diverse population of more than 8.5 million people, New York City's response to COVID-19 also meant that the language access priorities of city agencies would evolve. In addition to coordination, uh, coordinating American Sign Language interpreters for each of the mayor's press conferences, emergency management is an active member of the Language Access Task Force, which led the efforts to make sure that New Yorkers with limited English proficiency have access to critical information, such as materials translated into 25 languages. Emergency management continues to lead a weekly call with hundreds of community and faith-based leaders, which serves as a platform to give updates on the city's operations, provide actionable recommendations to participants on how to prepare and support their respective communities, and incorporates 
experts from various city agencies to share their COVID-19 specific services with these stakeholders. Our public-private team also started talking to the city's private sector earlier this year and throughout the emergency. That team remains engaged, working on supporting the food team, supply chain monitoring, and industries across the city. Although we are still in the midst of the emergency and remain activated, we have started the process of looking at our response over the last several months and analyzing lessons learned as we prepare for potential second wave, summer heat, and hurricane season. While this after action review is ongoing, we have already identified successes and challenges. For the first time ever, much of the agency and our interagency partners need to operate remotely for extended periods of time. With remote work came challenges in data collection and management. In March, we were still heavily relying on traditional methods, including emails, static attachments, and phone calls. Seemingly overnight, our small data and technology teams identified, configured, and implemented more advanced virtual work, data management, and visualization technologies that had advanced how we do business. The COVID-19 response has highlighted the need for the city to prioritize sophisticated and integrated data sharing technology. Adapting the city's commodity distribution point plan into a socially distanced, sustained delivery model delivering over 28 million meals and counting to people who are both COVID-19 vulnerable and food insecure in the last two months was a true success. Yet it has not come without challenges and we continue to develop and improve food distribution site operations to maximize the city's ability to feed hungry New Yorkers during this crisis while minimizing localized community impacts. Operationalizing a citywide staffing cell to surge healthcare worker staff and coordinating with state, federal, and private partners to operate medical search spaces for COVID-19 patients was a tremendous effort. Going forward, we are identifying facilities to potentially use as alternate care sites in all boroughs, working with our federal partners on mobilization plans and developing revised approaches to surge staffing. Finally, we continue to refine our process, uh, processes and procedures to support virtual instead of in-person coordination. Ultimately, emergency management and our workforce will be better able to serve New Yorkers through these technological advancements. As the city enters month five of this activation, emergency managers priorities remain the same, flattening the curve and raising the bar. We continue to work on a large hoteling program for healthcare workers who are unable to safely isolate at home, supplying food for vulnerable populations, supporting ongoing fatality management operations, and keeping the public informed. Early on in our response, we created the Cascading Impacts Planning Team. The purpose of the team is to adapt city emergencies plans to account for the challenges the city would still, fa uh, still faces around social distancing and COVID-19 impacts. The Cascading Impacts Planning Team was charged with looking forward and developing plans for what comes next in COVID-19 world. To date, our vacate protocol, heat emergency plan, power and cooling center operation have been updated to reflect our new reality. As the Atlantic hurricane season and heat season arrive, the Cascading Impacts team is working with our partners on revising our heat and coastal storm plans to ensure the city can appropriately respond to additional seasonal emergencies. The number of those who have succumbed to the disease have already surpassed an unimaginable toll. City employees have, was, have been lost in the battle against COVID-19 including our own Gregory Hodge, a 20-year FDNY EMT who was de detailed to emergency management in our watch command. As the world continues to fight this pandemic, we are reminded that while this is a time of uncertainty, we are in this together and we will never stop planning and we never stop preparing. Our dedicated emergency managers are all in and up to the challenge. Now, emergency management, if you are uh, happy to take any questions that you may have, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I will now turn it over to Chair Borelli uh, for questions. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question period. Um, thank you, Chair Borelli, please begin. Uh, thank you. I first want to acknowledge uh, that we're joined by council members Maisel, Jaeger and Brannon, who have joined us since my last update. Uh, I, I want to stay with uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner DeMora for a moment, uh, and I want to just address very frankly uh, an issue that has made a number of New York City families extremely angry uh, and extremely concerned, 
you had mentioned uh, when you spoke about healthcare surge, uh, the, the wonderful job that the agency did building uh, facilities in non-conventional locations. You mentioned the Javits Center, you mentioned the, the Brooklyn Water Terminal, uh, you mentioned the Billie Jean King Tennis Center. Explain to, to me and, and really explain to the public then why those facilities would not have been used to house COVID-19 positive patients who were otherwise living in nursing homes and why those people would have been sent back to nursing homes and not those facilities. Um, nursing home facilities, as well as uh, all healthcare movement is controlled by the uh, patient movement, is controlled by New York State Department of Health. So it was under their purview to give guidance on where, what patients would go where, um, especially from nursing homes, because that's directly uh, uh, under their purview. But, but just as, as, a, as a practical matter, uh, did the agency ever raise any red flags uh, and say, hey, guys, uh, you know, there's, there's an available beds at these facilities. We, we spent all this time and money building these facilities. Uh, it's counterproductive that you would be sending those people back to nursing homes when we have those facilities. So again, were there any sort of red flags waved to your knowledge by uh, NYC OEM uh, or perhaps even New York City Department of Health or uh, Health and Hospital Corporation? Well, it's a general rule of thumb. We, we, uh, we had coordination calls uh, practically every day with Department of Health. Uh, New York State Department of Health was uh, operating a uh, evacuation a coordination center at the Javits Center. So they, they were aware of uh, bed availability um, uh, spaces that were able to be used, um, but it was ultimately up to the Department of Health of where those patients were. Okay, uh, so j just to be clear, Department of Health was well aware of the problem of, of you know, COVID-19 patients returning to nursing homes, but they were also keenly aware of the availability of beds in facilities that were designed to take COVID-19 positive patients. And this was all because of uh, a, a New York State Department of Health guideline uh, that, in my opinion, was issued on, on, on March 25th. I think that's the date. But that was all related to that particular guideline? Uh, I believe so, yes. So, so is it fair to say that an overwhelming number of COVID-19 deaths in New York City are attributable to, to some degree uh, to this decision to return COVID-19 patients to nursing homes and not the availability of beds that your agency and, and the federal government and other resources uh, did a great job building. Yeah, well, I would say there's probably a lot of factors. I'd just say on a positive note, we had uh, supply PPE uh, to nursing homes. Uh, you know, we tried to do the best we can to support them. But ultimately, that policy decision was the uh, State Department of Health. But, but it was pretty clear, you know, not, not even that late into the pandemic that older New Yorkers and older citizens were particularly vulnerable to COVID-19, correct? Yes. Okay. So I just want to just be clear that, that many of the uh, deaths that unfortunately uh, befell our city were attributed to this, this insane decision to put the disease back into proximity with our most vulnerable, vulnerable population into facilities that otherwise may not be able to have cared for them in isolation. But let's just go now to uh, some other uh, things. Um, uh, this is for the fire department. And you'll have to excuse me, I can't actually face anyone uh, when I address them. So I'll just, I'll just sort of call out who I'm going to ask the uh, question. Um, we had sort of a compounding issue with uh, FDNY EMTs, and we know that we had to uh, implement the National Ambulance Contract. I got to meet with so many of those units from around the country. It was, it was great to see them, great to meet them. Uh, and, you know, a great job by, by um, FEMA and uh, the fire department for coordinating that. But as we look towards the recovery and we look towards a potential second wave, can you just go over again, uh, perhaps, you know, uh, uh, Chief Sudnick or, or uh, Deputy Commissioner Kavanaugh, how you plan on addressing that problem if the absence rate of EMTs becomes an issue again? Chief Bonsignor, do you want to take that one? Oh, hi, Chief Bonsignor. I didn't see you there. How are you? I can see you. Hey, uh, good morning. So, uh, yeah, the, the National Ambulance contract was extremely helpful for us during the first wave 
when we saw a very rapid and increasing number of calls uh, coming in. We got up to about 25% medical leave during that period of time. And by, by uh, reinforcing the field with uh, not only the, the national ambulance contracts, but also our partners in the voluntary hospital sector and our volunteers, uh, that was very helpful. But one of the other things we, we did and we would do again in the future if we had to do this is we took all of our offline position people from all internal kind of uh, units and areas and put them all back out into the field. So we had a nice uh, influx of people and we broke it down into two waves uh, so that you know we, we knew that medical leave was getting high. We knew that this was a highly contagious and infectious environment. Uh, so the first wave of people went out and they were timed with the first wave of the NAC units that we got. And then the second wave went out a couple of weeks later with the second wave of NAC units that we got. So part of getting the second wave out meant that we had to expedite training. Uh, we, we finished up our paramedic basic class. We finished up our uh, probie class and we were able to get uh, the rest of the people who were um, still in inside <clears throat> positions out to the field. So they were, you know, it was an influx of several hundred people, uh, including the NAC units. So part of our strategy moving forward is going to include anybody who is in an offline position, uh, go back into the field, uh, including our training staff. And uh, we canceled, uh, we canceled training. Another critical point for us, and we would ask to do the same thing in the future should this happen. Uh, if it happens more immediately, we're still covered. But we requested and we received an extension of all of our EMS certifications. Uh, so both uh, New York State and also REMAC certifications were extended for all EMS providers for one year, which meant that we weren't going to have to face um, taking people offline due to, due to expiring certifications. So all, all of those tactics can be employed very quickly again. I, I don't believe there are any proposed headcount uh, cuts for EMS personnel. Um, has there been any push on your end, on the agency's end, to recruit additional EMS personnel? Yes, sir. In fact, we're swearing in 180 new trainee EMT trainees on June 22nd. So we're, we're going full, full fledged with uh, hiring and, and uh, keeping our head count, uh, you know, steady. We're will, will also, that, will that I'm maintain sorry. it? Will that maintain the head count or will that grow the head count? That, that will grow the head count for now. And, and we hope to continue hiring at our regular rate in order to, uh, you know, uh, reach our, our head count. Um, also, also we have our medic basic class that we had pulled out of training and put them back in the field. They're going back into training. They're going back into their medic class. So uh, by January, we'll have another full class of paramedics hitting the field. And by October or so, we'll have a 180 or slightly less uh, EMTs hitting the field. So, you know, we are in a hiring cycle that we hope to continue. And, um, you know, that keeps us on track with what we were trying to achieve pre-COVID. And what will trigger uh, sort of the, the contingency plans, whether they be pulling people back into the field or uh, doing and implementing EMS shift scheduling work? So, so some of the triggers include, and, and again, like the commissioner mentioned, we're monitoring these, uh, these numbers daily, but some of the triggers include uh, increasing call volume, uh, trends of types of calls, for, for example, fever, cough, which is a, a category that was uh, instituted so we could track specific types of patients and clusters of patients, as well as uh, medical leave, the, the rate of medical leave. So these things are all, uh, you know, monitored on a regular basis. And, you know, the, the other thing that we have done is we were able to move the entire EMS system to a 12-hour tour schedule which is something that didn't exist prior. You know, it meant that we had to revamp the entire uh, scheduling platform for EMS, but we were able to successfully do that. So that helps us as well. Um, thank you. I wanna talk uh, next about PPE. I, I noticed my, uh, my screen had froze for a moment. So if uh, Josh, you could just give me a thumbs up. 
if, uh, if I'm coming in clear. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I want to speak about PPE because I, I've spoken to some of the department folks. So this is the fire department uh, who talked about the stockpiling of PPE and masks. And there was an idea, I think, that the stockpile um, would have lasted for about three months if there was normal use. Can, can you just explain what that meant and why there was a shortfall and what the department plans on doing to uh, change, the, change the concept, perhaps, of normal use? Um, so I think I would say maybe not normal use since EMS never operates in normal circumstances, but average use, we had built up a stockpile of about three months, um, which had been a, a number that our doctors had recommended in other pandemics. We obviously saw a huge increase in the use of PPE in this pandemic, and I think most significantly was the worldwide competition for PPE. Um, that was a, you know, a huge challenge for the fire department and a huge challenge for other agencies, in particular because while we knew how long our stockpile would last, we did not know whether or not um, the country would even have PPE at some point in this emergency, and that was a huge concern for us. Um, and a reason that we monitored the PPE that we had so closely and we went to such uh, lengthy uh, efforts to get it from, from every possible pl place, including um, through our foundation. In the future, um, we have already begun stockpiling that PPE at much greater levels. We now have a COVID use level. And so our stockpiling and our, our goals are based on that COVID use level. Um, and it, it is also based on the idea that we won't be able to necessarily count on a federal stockpile, which had been uh, plan B uh, prior to this. We are, we are preparing a stockpile that we can support ourselves through a second wave. Okay. And uh, can uh, emergency management also comment on that as far as their stockpile for use, uh, presumably by other agencies and nonprofits? Yeah. So we coordinate with the Department of Health and their warehouse. So if we get any requests, we sort of we field with them to sort of push to uh, you now we're pushing to hospitals or healthcare facilities. So uh, any requests we get, we work with the Department of Health to fill those requests. OK, uh, Commissioner Cavanaugh, I just want to speak to you briefly then about telemedicine. Uh, you had mentioned it. C can you sort of give us again uh, and forgive me if you, you sort of mentioned it already, but can you give us sort of the overview of the department's use of telemedicine? So the department uh, implemented telemedicine as the COVID pandemic hit. Um, we were able to do that under the emergency order that uh, the state had issued. We had been planning to implement telemedicine prior to this. And so we had a lot of the infrastructure in place already, um, but we did not have the ability to implement it. We were still working with the state to get some of the permissions that are required, but the emergency order gave us that permission. And so we implemented it right away. Um, for us, telemedicine is utilized when uh, patients call 911 and they may have a condition which needs treatment of some sort, but of which an emergency room would not be the ideal place or the only place they can get that treatment. Um, and obviously in the midst of COVID, as everybody knows, and an emergency room was an especially difficult place to seek treatment, um, both because of the risk of getting COVID and the sheer number of patients emergency rooms were grappling with. So some examples of that might be somebody who needs a prescription filled in order to manage a chronic illness. Um, telemedicine can deal with that and our dispatchers are able to identify those patients through triage and transfer them over to a doctor on the telemedicine hotline um, so that they can have their medical issue addressed um, but not be picked up or transferred by us and, and not be uh, not end up in the emergency room. Do you have an idea of how many calls were resolved through telemedicine uh, a percentage or, or a volume number? Uh, I don't have a volume offhand. We can get that to you uh, for sure. Okay, and if, if you were if you were talking to me over a cup of coffee uh, in layman's terms, would you say the use of telemedicine is working? I would say that it's working and we should continue to implement it and ensure that it is working uh, even better for any condition where it is appropriate. Um, it's absolutely, I think, something that New Yorkers uh, want and need, and that was proven out in this pandemic as we were able to divert people from emergency rooms. So I would encourage um, the whole city to keep moving forward on the implementation. And, and you see a role for telemedicine in the future uh, potential wave of COVID as well? 
Absolutely. Um, I think speaking to what Chief Bonsignor was addressing about these spikes in volume and all of the different resources that we have to bring together to address those, those major spikes. Um, telemedicine is a key part of that because it helps treat patients um, that aren't in need of EMS or emergency room services. And so it makes sure that our EMTs and paramedics are available for the most critically ill patients, which is exactly uh, what we want. Okay, uh, before, I, I'm gonna give one more question to uh, the Department of Emergency Management, then I'm gonna hand it over to some of my colleagues who have questions, and then I would like to come back uh, with some COVID budget-related questions uh, after they, they give some questions. Uh, so just OEM, just can you just give us the overview of the, the contracts you are now involved with, with hotels, uh, whether they need to be continued and, and is there any, uh, any thought on keeping those through the next wave? Yeah, uh, we currently have a, a couple of contracts that are helping uh, healthcare workers, uh, 11,000 healthcare workers themselves. Uh, we also have some other contracts regarding um, Mach J um, hotels that are housing some folks. Uh, so I think we're in the process of renewing some of them with uh, Hotel Engine, uh, who's a subcontractor to crew. But uh, I think by the end of June, I think we'll have some more information about that, right? Okay, uh, no, no members actually have their hands raised right now for questions, so I'll just continue. Um, Budget related uh, with the FDNY, the, uh, the three largest civilian uh, headcount lines are uh, fleet maintenance, dispatchers, and headquarters inspection. Um, can you just go over perhaps how many of these positions are currently vacant and um, how many need to be filled or whether this is an area where headcount reduction is possible? Uh, so I don't know exact vacancies offhand. There are a few vacancies uh, in all of those areas. And uh, I'd say those are all essential services for the fire department. And so we do need to fill those vacancies. I would not consider those um, areas where a reduction is possible at this point. And can you just discuss um, what a hiring freeze for the department would mean in terms of where we would sooner be short staffed than not and what would be the impact on the the, the public face of the department and the interaction with the uh, public, either in emergencies or uh, on the civilian inspection side? Sure. So I, I think, as you know, you know, we are still in the middle of budget discussion, so I can't say for sure um, where the city will land on this, but certainly in other budget crises, uh, you know, fire and EMS personnel have been the last place um, where hiring freezes have taken effect because that is our core mission and that is what we need to continue to do every day. And as Chief Bonds and you mentioned, we are still um, being instructed to hire on those fronts. Uh, in terms of other critical positions um, that play an administrative role for our uniform personnel, I think that we are, are still working on that, but the positions that you mentioned are really essential for, for fire and EMS operations to do their jobs. Obviously mechanics have to make sure our fire truck is running, dispatchers have to make sure calls are answered. Um, I think that we would see our hiring freeze uh, impacting far more the um, administrative civilian uh, positions, especially those, those that are unfilled in the department right now will probably not be filled in the course of this hiring freeze. Um, and, and there's definitely no, no talk about a hiring freeze with respect to EMS uh, training at all, correct? I have not heard one, no. Okay. Uh, I, I should also mention, I failed to mention that for fire prevention, those are revenue generating uh, positions. So uh, that's a, a separate conversation that we expect uh, to continue with, with OMB about filling chief positions. Um, is, has there been any uh, uh, drop off in inspections uh, moving forward, considering the role that some of the inspectors have had to take on with uh, respect to enforcement for COVID rules? Uh, chief Jordan, would you like to take that one? Sure, I don't uh, think that we uh, recognize the drop off in inspections due to the repurposing of a number of inspectors uh, to the um, COVID emergency order effort. Uh, that those were inspectors formerly inspect places of assembly and uh, restaurants and nightclubs, which of course were closed. Although we did uh, experience a drop off in, of inspections, it was 
uh, mostly due to the fact that the uh, places we were we would normally inspect were closed. And in fact, we had a, a number of our uh, inspectional and support staff who were on COVID related leave for several weeks at a time. So I don't know that um, the repurposing of our staff was a cause of a reduction in uh, our normal uh, inspection types. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Cavanaugh, can, can you just talk about the counseling that the department has offered to some of its members, uh, whether they're EMTs or firefighters, uh, in response to COVID and some of the challenges that the, the uh, program has faced? Sure. Um, so our counseling services unit um, has been uh, very robust and very much tailored to the needs of our uniform members. Um, it was really grown after 9-11 out of that need um, and has, has continued to grow ever since. We do believe that we will need to grow uh, the unit, particularly peer counselors who are uniform members who help connect members in the field to uh, professional mental health services. So we actually believe that's an area in which we're going to need to grow going forward. Um, you know, as you know, our members have seen an extraordinary amount of loss in the course of their jobs, um, particularly our EMTs and paramedics. And we have a number of people who graduated from fire and EMS academies in the middle of this pandemic. And that is, that is a really intense experience to have gone through. Um, so we're actually gonna be growing our counseling services unit. Um, we believe that there are a couple positions in that unit um, that will uh, not be affected by the hiring freeze. And we are gonna utilize um, the combination of filling those uh, lines of professional counselors along with our, our rank peer counselors to address the mental health needs of our members coming out of this pandemic. So uh, some folks are proposing uh, uh, an early retirement incentive for uh, members of the fire department along with nearly every agency. Um, this is something that the city did in 2010 and 11. Uh, the city did it also in 95 and 91 uh, with various agencies. Um, given the economic foreshadowing that we think will happen uh, over the next, uh, certainly the next budget year, if not potentially the future, is the, the department even running the numbers on what um, an early re retirement incentive might look like or who would qualify? I, mean, I don't, I don't want to get into details now because I know and you know that this will, the rumor mill will go crazy uh, with, with, with people interested in perhaps taking advantage. But is this something that the department is actively looking at? So uh, we're not actively looking at it because, uh, as you mentioned, we have uh, not seen the specifics of what that would look like. If we had the specifics of the terms, we would obviously run that and look at what impact that would have um, on our membership. I, th I think, as you know, that has been done in, in previous budget crises. And so we expect that that may be something um, we will be asked to look at in the near future. I, th I think we would share your point of view um, that we would prefer to do that before we laid off or did any hiring freezes. So I think we are aligned on that front, um, but we have not heard any specifics. And so we haven't been able to run any numbers in that regard. Has, has uh, OMB asked you to do any analysis of what that would look like um, potentially? Uh, I think I'd have to ask our budget director. Um, they have not asked me, but that would typically not be my role. So we can check with them and get back to you. Thank you. Um, on promotional exams, can you give us the status of promotional exams uh, from, from lieutenant to captain, et cetera, from uh, EMS uh, to EMS officers? Just, just give us the grand scope of promotional exams and what you envision doing for the next fiscal year uh, and beyond. Uh, so we are currently in discussion with DCAS. Um, I can let Chief uh, Sudnick expand on that if you would like, but we are currently in discussions with them to find out uh, what that looks like, what promotional exams look like in a uh, COVID world with social distance, um, which will, will be very different than how our exams have been given in the past. So I'm sure you know a number of them have been delayed, um, but we are wor actively working with DCAS to figure out when to reschedule them and, and what an exam would look like in this new environment. So we, we, definitely, we definitely plan to continue uh, those promotional exams as soon as that is feasible. And uh, is there any decision made to sort of kick down uh, some of the classes of promotions? Kick uh, down mean by kick down. Um, meaning, meaning delay them uh, to, to save money. Uh, I don't think there is a plan at this time, Chief Sudnick. Is there anything you'd like to 
Yeah, and, uh, there's no uh, no plan to reduce the number of promotions at this time. So uh, both on the fire uh, fire operations side, uh, our lieutenants uh, list, the current lieutenants list and captains list, both expire on the same day in August. Uh, test uh, exams were scheduled for for May uh, and and June for um, for lieutenant and captain. Obviously, we we couldn't have those exams due to the to the pandemic. So uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been um, uh, having some teleconferences with with uh, DCAS and trying to come up with a, a solution to administer an exam for both the captain and lieutenant uh, uh, as soon as possible. Um, the panels were um, were enlisted. Uh, they got the, the bulk of their work done prior to the pandemic. Uh, so uh, we're just uh, trying to come up with a solution as far as uh, a venue is concerned and um, to try to conduct uh, or try to get a venue large enough where we can, we can conduct a, um, an exam using social distancing uh, and, uh, and, and all the other um, precautions we need to take to uh, protect our members. So uh, we have another call on this um, later on this week. So. Uh, so, so we're working hard to try to get those exams uh, in place. Um, I know for the members in the field, uh, they're concerned because uh, they study hard for these exams. We, we acknowledge that. Um, it's a very difficult uh, process. They only give an exam once every four years. So um, clearly, um, th there's a lot of anxiety in the field about the uncertainty behind this. But we are working hard to try to come up with that solution. And uh, what is the typical time frame between the issuing of an exam, meaning the date it's it's set, and um, the actual hiring of new classes? So um, that's a good question. Um, we anticipate it could take up to a year by the time you administer the exam, and then you process it to where you actually come out with a list. Um, a lot of that is beyond our control. Um, most of it's beyond our control, actually. It, it depends on how fast DCAS is able to process uh, the um, protest sessions and, and things like that. So, uh, but typically, um, uh, past experience has shown it take could take up to a year. So, um, so for example, if we were able to uh, administer exam later this summer, um, uh, in a best case scenario, uh, it could take upwards to another year. Uh, so next summer before we we could see a um, a list be established. Okay. So, is that, is um, how does how does that impact um, the budget? hiring? Uh, well, the budget, uh, I, I, I'll have to uh, defer to Commissioner Kavanaugh as far as that's concerned. But again, uh, from what I'm, we're hearing, um, uh, as of right now, there are no plans, concrete plans, to um, uh, for fire uh, operations or EMS operations, the uniform side, for any uh, budget reductions in that regard at this point. Uh, she you. can comment on that if, uh, if I'm accurate in that statement. That's correct. Uh, thank you. So just a final question for New York City Emergency Management. Uh, has that agency been directed uh, to have any sort of hiring freeze? Uh, and if so, uh, where will operations be short staffed? Uh, or w where is there need within the agency to uh, bring in staff that you might not be budgeted for? Uh, well, as you know, we have a lot of detailed staff like myself here, so we're not going anywhere. But uh, I think as we look at the budget going further, we'll see how we could uh, manage that if there's any uh, potential with uh, not hiring folks that we were looking to uh, pick up. So I think um, right now, I think there's, uh, there's, there is some sort of uh, budgetary constraints, but we're looking at that right now. So, and also, thank you. Uh, all our grants are still, are still in effect, so we could hire off grants as well. So I think on the grant side, we're okay. Thank you. And then uh, just a final question now for the department. Uh, just you guys didn't comment on the two uh, bills that were included in today's hearing. Uh, do you have any objections to the bill uh, regarding recruitment of uh, military personnel or the reporting of uh, the uh, inspection units? Uh, we do not have an objection. There might be some small changes we might want to make to the language simply to align it with how we keep our data, but those would be relatively minor. We could discuss them offline. Uh, Commissioner Noonan, I don't know if you want to add anything, but we already do pretty extensive uh, recruitment of veterans. Let the record right. show it froze after you said, I have no objection. The <laughs> um, I, I don't see any, any council members with questions. I'll give everyone a moment. Uh, 
Can, can I just mention one other thing? I, I oh, think yes, you mentioned sorry. both. You, you talked about the veterans bill, but there are two bills. Uh, and the, the other, be, other bill, um, we would have an inspection to simply because we worry that it would take staff away from inspection services in order to uh, report the information required in the bill. So that's one that we'd like to discuss with you a little bit uh, further before we move forward. Great. Thank you. Uh, Josh, has any member signed up for questions? No. Okay, then uh, I will uh, dismiss this panel and um, I will turn it back over to the committee council to uh, figure out uh, who is the next panel. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for the testimony, uh, both of those agencies. Um, I would ask that someone from the administration uh, stay on the line to uh, hear the, the remaining uh, public testimony, which as of now is only uh, two individuals. So that shouldn't, um, I hope that you're able to stay. Um, we'll now turn to the public testimony section of this hearing. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on them after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member and the staff will unmute you and you can begin delivering your testimony. Um, so I think we're going to start with Oren um, from the EMS union. Um, Oren, are you uh, unmuted? You are? Yep. Go, go ahead, sir. Okay. Good morning, Chair and committee members. My name is Oren Barzalay, President of FDNY EMS Local 2507, representing EMTs, paramedics, and fire inspectors. Once again, I come before the distinguished members of this committee to provide an insight into the latest of a long list of inadequacies within the FDNY EMS. As usual, and as always, the system squeaked and grown nearly collapsing in the face of a crisis response. The order that we were given was changing on a daily and sometimes hourly basis, where an inept reaction is opposed to innovative Proaction. We have handled crisis responses such as superstorms, blizzards, heat waves, terrorism, and responded appropriately. This was unlike anything we have ever seen, and the responses should not have relied on those precedents. As the daily call volume spiked to 7,000 calls, with numerous assignments located in highly infectious environments, the department was unable to provide the highest level of PPE. Our members were issued basics masks and hinted this mask should be reused. This local was forced to procure PPE from outside donations. Masks, face shields, and goggles were donated to us when the lack of the department provided PPE became a national embarrassment. Aside from the lack of personal protective equipment, the department failed to timely secure other means of measures to protect our members. The treatment of symptoms caused by the virus required our EMTs and paramedics to often perform critical respiratory care. This includes oxygen administration, aerosolized medication administration, manual assisting ventilations and intubation. While all of these life-saving treatments are necessary for the care of our patients, they also pose a risk to increase the spread of the virus. Equipment such as bacterial viral filters would have greatly decreased that risk, potentially decreasing the number of sick EMTs and paramedics. From the beginning of this emergency, the department ignored the advice of this union to enact the 12 hour tour shifts. The scheduling change would have greatly limited the exposure by members having, to, having one steady partner as opposed to two and limiting the rotations of members through the stations. As well as the schedule in rest for the members to recuperate and stay healthy. Instead, the department enacted ill-convinced scheduling charts that resulted in soaring of service times. This resulted in my members working 16 hour shifts day after day, sometimes five days straight. We saw an increased rate of infection and illnesses totaling over 1,400 EMTs and paramedics to date. And the deaths of EMT Richard Seabury, John Red, Idris Bay, Greg Hodge, 
and two fire inspectors that the family requested their names be kept confidential. Only after these incidents did the department adopt our suggestions and with no surprise to us, the rate of infections declined and in-service times and staffing increased to over 100%, which has rarely been seen even prior to the pandemic. The EMS workforce was the first and frontline response to the virus. CFR response was decreased to only respond to priority one assignments. PD response was curtailed. The entire bur burden of the 911 response was placed squarely on the, mem of the members of the emergency medical service with only marginal support. There are talks of the second wave, whether it is next month or next year, will the department be prepared? Or will history repeat itself as it always has and at the expense of our members? Thank you for your time. I will take any questions. Uh, we will go to Chair Borelli to start. Thanks, sorry, had an issue with the mute. Um, uh, Oren, if, if you could just, uh, I just have one question. I, considering this is a hearing about going forward, um, I, I really wanna know your quick take on uh, what the department should be doing uh, to prepare for a second wave uh, with respect to how your members can better serve the public. Well, um, some equipment, as I mentioned about aerosolized uh, treatments that needed to be done. Uh, I haven't heard anything of that equipment arriving. I know it's been ordered. Uh, when we intubate patients, uh, that's a critical time for our members to be infected. And these filters have been uh, out there for quite some time, but we still haven't heard about that shipment arriving. Um, I'm glad that they're, you know, stockpiling on the N95s and other PPE equipment that's necessary to protect uh, the men and women. However, if you look around the country, um, N95 masks and goggles are not, is not the end all for protecting people. Um, as I said uh, a second ago, if you look around the country, they have uh, full body gear that they covered themselves. This thing lands on your hair, lands on your clothes. Then you touch it, you know, after you are, you're done with your patient contact. You know, you go like this, you, you can contaminate yourself again. So, um, if, if, again, if you look, uh, some cities were using SCBAs. They were using full Tyvek suits. Uh, this thing is unpredictable. Uh, just yesterday, uh, the World Health Organization is now saying that made a mistake that asymptomatic patients are now contagious. So um, I, I'm just hoping that we learn the lesson, get better equipment, so we, we don't face uh, many more ill first responders. Thank you. Uh, I, I have no further questions for you, uh, Oren, if we want to call our next uh, witness, Josh. Uh, thank you, Chair Burley. We will now um, receive testimony from Laura Rothrock. You may, you may go ahead. Good morning, Chairman Borelli and members of the New York City Council Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. My name is Laura Rothrock, and I'm providing testimony on behalf of the New York Coalition of Code Consultants, also known as NYCCC. NYCCC is a nonprofit trade organization whose members specialize in securing construction and development approvals from municipal agencies, as well as building code and zoning consulting. I'm testifying today in support of intro 1841, which would require the fire department to issue reports on the department's fire alarm inspection unit. NYCCC member companies work very closely with the FDNY fire alarm inspection unit, as well as other units within the FDNY to ensure compliance and safety in New York City's buildings. As an organization, we have had regular discussions with FDNY to share industry feedback and discuss ways in which FDNY and industry partners can work together more efficiently without compromising safety. FDNY has been a collaborative partner to the industry and receptive to our recommendations, but the agency is lacking critical resources and staff to perform their essential fu functions. 
It is our understanding that the delays in fire alarm inspections are due to the need for additional technical staff within the unit, compounded by a growing number of new applications. With the COVID-19 crisis impacting city funding across the board, we fear that the resource problem of the FDNY will only be compounded further. Even though the construction industry is getting back to work, the FDNY's lack of resources can hinder the city's economic rebound in a meaningful way. While we understand that this bill will not solve the critical funding issues that need to be addressed, NYCCC supports this bill as a step in the right direction for more transparency. However, we suggest that the council amend the bill to also include reporting on fire alarm plan examinations. Plan examinations are a critical part of the process for building occupancy to occur. Recently, FDNY absorbed all of the plan review responsibilities that were previously managed in part by the Department of Buildings, significantly increasing FDNY's burden. The wait time for plan review is 40 days, and if there are any objections, a second review takes 40 more days and so on. Our hope is that FDNY can provide city council with data on an ongoing basis, not in a manner that is, in, that is an administrative burden for the agency, but so that data can inform the important funding decisions of this body. We thank you for your consideration of this important matter. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I, I do not have any questions for you, so I will turn it over to uh, the committee council to see if there are any other members who have questions or any other members of the public who wish to testify. Uh, thanks so much, Chair Borelli. Um, at this time, if uh, any members have any questions, please speak up, or if there's anyone else who wishes to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. If not, I'll turn it back to Borelli to uh, close things out. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to the uh, members of the FDNY and to New York City Emergency Management for their participation in today's hearing. Uh, this officially uh, closes out uh, this hearing of the Committee on Fire and Emergency Management. It's a sword. Sorry, everyone. Thanks, everyone.